I'm Tom Logan, co-founder and CEO of Coley, and we are changing the way that brands generate content in the digital age by helping them tap into our network of third-party creators uh, to help generate photos, videos, uh, content like that to help uh, then fuel their digital marketing efforts. I'm David Wagner, the CMO and co-founder of P3 Media, New York's top digital agency. Coley has over 110,000 different creators on the platform, ranging from up-and-coming creators uh, up to uh, more professional photographers. Tom, thanks for joining us today, man. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to kick things off, I'd love to just get some of your backstory and, and kind of learn about where you sure. uh, came up with the concept for Coley, and, and I'd love to hear about the early years of launching the brand. Yeah, gosh, it's fun to reminisce about. Um, I had met my co-founder, Eric Graber, at a company called Pecora uh, back in the Bay Area. And what we were focused on there is this concept of user-generated content. So helping brands like discover and gain rights to and then actually repurpose photos, videos, really content that was primarily appearing on social channels, Instagram specifically. And um, the idea behind that is that this type of content was A, you know, very inexpensive to acquire, of course, um, but then that, that same type of content when repurposed uh, really would resonate with in particular, a millennial consumer who craved authenticity and wanted to um, really have a relationship with that brand. Yeah. So how did you move from uh, co-workers to co-founders? Yeah. A fun transition. Uh, so actually, once, uh, once Bacora was acquired by a company called Olapic, uh, we, like a lot of founders, still had an itch to scratch. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of issues uh, within the user-generated space that we felt that we could still solve uh, in a better way. So a few of those issues were um, the actual timing of the content. Once a brand releases a new product, they typically have to wait a couple months to get uh, critical mass around the, uh, around the actual user-generated content that they needed to use. Uh, there, were some, there were some issues around legalities. There were some issues around um, having products featured across the board, right? So if I'm Nike and I just released 20 products, if I have enough user-generated content for 10 of them, uh, but my other 10 SKUs are totally void of content, yeah. then I now have a problem. I have a, I have an, I have a real risk uh, in the sense that, A, I believe that, uh, that user-generated content is going to perform for me because the data tells me that it does, um, and it poses a risk to the business to not have uh, ample content for those other SKUs. Um, so essentially what we've done at Coley is to continue to scratch that itch and solve a lot of those same problems we're just doing it in a different way through a highly vetted network of creators. Yeah. Yeah. So those creators span from like up and coming creators who, who might not have any social clout really, but they create awesome content just with a smartphone in their hand, um, all the way up through you know, more traditional influencers and then into photographers, videographers. Yeah. But uh, speaking of that, I'd love to get your perspective in terms of the full sort of span of influencer from the micro to the macro. Um, yeah. The, the brands listening, I'm sure they'd love some perspective in terms of um, the effectiveness of the different sort of, again, variety of influencers and where you see the most success and where you think there's room for opportunity for brands jumping in. Sure. Uh, at the risk of just following um, large, like, in vogue comments and trends, uh, micro-influencers and the smaller types of up-and-coming influencers are certainly, at least what we're seeing, um, more capable of, of carrying authentic messages that are going to actually drive consumer behavior. So what we've seen, um, what we've seen kind of across the board, unless it's a subscription business that's looking to uh, actually measure ROI on more of a lifetime value basis, um, influencer marketing isn't necessarily a performance channel, uh, but it is certainly very powerful in the sense that it's able to carry an authentic message. I mean, third parties who are carrying a brand message are viewed as 92% more trustworthy than messaging that's directly received from a brand. And influencers who these, who these audiences have willingly chosen to follow um, certainly fall into that category. Tell me more specifically, I mean, what's some of the value yeah. that is being driven from these influencer campaigns? So the way that we approach this with the majority of our clients at Coley is to actually have the content output be the primary focus of, uh, of these actual campaigns. Um, and when content is the focus, the actual social clout becomes less important naturally, right? So many of our campaigns might ask for uh, for a social post, but they'll also ask for three, four plus photos um, that the brand is then able to acquire rights to and then disseminate across channels and basically take into their content library, take ownership of them, and um, then drive better performance 
across these digital channels. Yeah. yeah. So have you seen any either data or literature, just from your platform, seen any sort of correlations between the type of content and creative you guys are putting out versus your traditional studio, really canned photography? A carpenter's only as good as, as their tools, right? So sometimes it's, it's more about just having more content and diverse content um, to drive more effective testing that ultimately leads to better results. Um, there is, I mean, I could go back to that user-generated content reference and, and backstory I was giving you, and, and say that a lot of the same content that's being generated by our network of creators looks a lot like sort of the top tier of user-generated content that we use to help brands harvest at Pecora. Um, we're just able to do that in a much more controlled and scalable way uh, and deliver that to brands when they actually need it. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. So I think the, you know, the audience that watches you know, our, our videos right. is really focused around the e-commerce landscape and how to drive more sales on their site. Totally. I'd say the majority are really focused around direct response and you know, input A into input B. Right. There's certainly a big component around branding, but I'd say being heavy proponents of testing across the board and really leveraging data to, to, to make right. high quality decisions. How do you guys view A-B testing, multivariate testing, really the data component to the business? Um, of course, it can, it can vary a bit depending on channel, and you guys talk a lot about multivariate testing um, across email, and I think part of the premise there is that you can't necessarily come at every audience with the exact same message, right, or with the exact same content. That's, that's a, sort of a continuation of that. Um, so me as a, as a 31-year-old consumer doesn't necessarily want to see the same thing that my 60-year-old you know, father would want to see. Um, and it's the same thing sort of across the board. So I think um, marketing has become, like it's very necessary for brands to be personal and to reach potential consumers in these pockets of consumers um, in a really personalized manner. Um, so I, I guess at a broader level, uh, I think marketers need more content than they've ever needed at any time in, in history. Um, right, so, and, and part of the reason is that you know, they, they need to meet the need across all of these growing channels. Like social networks didn't exist 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, but people also need more personalized experiences uh, than ever before as well, particularly when we're talking about the millennial consumer that craves authenticity, um, that really does, to, does need to know that brand story and needs to feel like they are connecting one-on-one -on -one with the brand, not, not just being sold to en masse. Yeah. And so when people are working with Coley and working with you guys for uh, creative generation, is this mostly around the advertising campaigns that they're running or email, site, like what does the, the typical process look like? In the case of product launches, in the case of just sort of sustained marketing efforts, um, they'll just need a variety of different content throughout the year. Um, so with us, you know, we might do campaigns that are very focused on um, 10 to 15 second like video tutorials or um, you know, aspirational type you know, iPhone videos. Yeah. Another might be more focused on um, simply lifestyle photos that are shot on iPhones. But I mean, the beauty of the time period that we live in now and, and really what we're trying to help facilitate is that uh, while brands do need more content than they've ever needed at any other time in history, we do have this amazing amalgamation of individuals who can create content that's really beautiful, that also performs really well, yeah right on their phones and it doesn't necessarily have to be shot in a studio. Really, if you have a phone in your hand, you are a creator. Yeah, and are you seeing any relationships with video versus static imagery? Specifically pertaining to, to Facebook and Instagram ads, yeah. uh, we do see motion um, really in, in any variety uh, tend to perform um, slightly better. And of course, you know, every, every situation is different and we, we don't want to make any assumptions. That's sort of like, uh, that's a major premise of our of our thesis as a business is like, you know, take you know, data, data is king, let's, let's measure with data. But um, sort of just as, as like a blanket um, takeaway that we've seen, yeah, motion of, of really any kind yes. does you really well. And it's interesting, I mean, that we see more and more brands using um, very raw looking iPhone video in these ads, short form, could just be a demo, could be, it could be a little unboxing, um, it could just be a little boomerang, it could be something as simple as that. Um, but I think motion does tend to catch the eye and, um, you know, naturally when you're consuming you know, just even a few more seconds of a brand's messaging, you know, that is, uh, that does tend to 
uh, start to wrap around a consumer's brain and, and start to tell a story of like what this brand is actually selling and what they're about versus just a static image. No, I completely agree. I mean, we're seeing the same sort of really unique user-generated content perform exceptionally well, particularly right. when you're kind of comparing it against the classic in-studio known model quantities. Right. Right. Um, so I mean, talking about the data side, let's double down on that and yeah. go into you know what KPIs matter to your clients internally. What K what KPIs matter to Coley? At a very basic level, we want to help make content generation as easy as possible and as scalable as possible, um, and not have to have brands sort of force their two to four photo shoots a year. Sometimes they're more, um, but not just trying to say like, all right, well, we can just stretch this right into social or. Let's, let's use the same exact content that we're using on this Facebook ad on our Pinterest board or something like that. Um, content needs are, are constantly evolving um, and it's, you know, brands find this pretty quickly. Um, they, they're going to need, <laughs> as they start to scale and as they start to grow, um, they, they need more content than they ever thought they would need. And it's gotta be fresh, it's gotta be coming in all the time. So to answer your question on, on KPIs, sometimes it's just assets generated. And for our more sophisticated clients, when we're directly working with their performance marketing teams, uh, we will be looking at how the content's actually performing across ads, what we're doing with uh, how our open rates are, uh, with specific audiences in, in email campaigns. Um, and then we'll start to take those learnings and we can then take action in our, in our subsequent campaigns. And once we can start to understand, all right, like this is, this is what's working here, let's generate some more of this. And because the actual cost per asset is so much lower with Coley than it would be you know, to you know, hire out a full team or you know, rent out a house and, and do a shoot with two or three models for a day um, and take on all the expenses that come with that, it just tends to scale more effectively. Yeah, I mean, so I'm sure everyone's really curious. You know, yeah. Walk us through a campaign at, from A to Z. So it starts with a creative brief and, and really campaigns are the mechanism that, that make everything happen within our, within our actual software platform. Um, so a campaign really will work backwards from an end set of goals. Um, so we try to be very specific with clients around where the content is going to be used and, and what, you know, what their specific needs are. Um, so within that brief, you have, um, you have content do's and don'ts. You have desired type of creator. Um, you know, maybe you have a desired like, geographic location or backdrop. Um, an example of that is like a Thursday Boots who I primarily just had content that was focused on here in New York because they're based in, in Manhattan, uh, but they started to see an uptick in sales just kind of organically in the Northwest and in California specifically. Um, but they didn't have any content to help actually connect with that audience in, in more of a personalized type of way. So rather than ship every, everyone out to California and, and get all that studio equipment out there and, and try to hire models and do expensive shoots, they actually just turned our network of creators essentially have them, the, the ones who kind of fit that mold and live in those geographic areas, um, just fill that need for them and generate content for them that could then you know, feed, their, feed their ad channels, feed their social and, and start, to, um, start to expand out and, and connect with, that, with those new types of geographic audiences. And they're not turning their back on, on their New York roots, uh, which are certainly aspirational and, and great to connect with, but um, when we're talking about this concept of personalization, having content that's going to connect with them is, is awesome. Yeah, and so in that case specifically, where were they deploying that content? Where was it being used? Primarily in, in targeted ad sets on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, but um, yeah, so back to the campaign question. I mean, every campaign is slightly different and every brief looks slightly different, uh, but we have this network of 110,000 creators. Uh, creators really being a blanket term that we apply to you know, anyone who creates content uh, within the Coley network and then um, we'll get that campaign out in front of the right group or the right audience. They'll apply, um, brand will pick their favorites based on what they're looking for and uh, again it's like that, it's those end KPIs that are, that are driving decision making and, and driving the campaign. End to end, how long does a campaign typically take to, to create and launch? We can, uh, we can always work around tighter timelines. Typically the way that we like to handle it is um, we work out the brief, we're using you know, our, our experience from thousands of campaigns that we've run um, that do at least have some level of overlap. Um, we have a five to seven day application period for the creators to apply. Uh, brands can also bring in like, any external creators. Um, they can search through our actual library and invite people more personally. 
but basically have, they have this applicant pool at the end of this application period. They'll go in, they'll pick their favorites based on sort of the criteria that they're looking for. Our platform can actually suggest people who might be uh, the best fit as well using our smart match technology. Um, and then it's just a matter of getting them product and uh, giving them a couple weeks to re both receive the product and then actually turn around the content. Uh, the creators submit their content at a by a specific date for brand review. Brand approves it, takes ownership of that content, and if there's a social component, the actual creator or influencer would go ahead and post on social. Let's go back a, a little bit in time. I'm curious, there's always this typical challenge with dual-sided business models. You've got the creators and the brands, yeah. and they're notoriously challenging to start these businesses from the beginning, beginning which you guys have done chicken the egg. quite successfully. Yeah, the chicken <laughs> and the egg. So I'd love yeah. to hear about how you approach that market at the beginning. It's a challenge in a variety of, of ways, and it continues to be a challenge because, you know, ultimately it's not about the number of creators that we have. It's about having the right amount of creators uh, that a brand needs who can actually follow through and do a great job um, creating the types of content that they, they, that they really do need desperately. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. Naturally, whenever human beings are involved, there are like, components of Murphy's Law. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just been a constant effort to continue to refine. We built a tool that could, that could scrape Instagram um, and based on our inputs or our criteria, would basically spit out matches and then we can, uh, we can, contact, that, we can contact those people in a way that's, uh, that's fairly automated. Um, and there are still instances where, where it might be a bit of an outlier brand or maybe we're trying to do a campaign that's specific to German citizens or something like that that's not uh, they won't be quite as easy to service and, and we can go out and, and, and source creators based on, based on that criteria using this tool. But um, I mean, to be honest with you, I think our first 2,000 or so influencers uh, really uh, haven't been our most active over the past couple years just because we didn't, have, we didn't have compelling brand names on there for them to work with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a it really difficult process. Yeah. Um, we've you know, just done our best to, to pull it together as, we, as, we, as we've gone, yeah. That's awesome. And yeah. Was there a turning point for you or a critical mass where you feel like you really sort of had the creators to support the brand audience? Yeah, and I actually think that it was, it was a, a little bit of a function of, of um, signing, starting to, to bring on bigger brands that, that we could either reference in our recruiting of creators yeah. um, or people you know, would reach out to these brands and you know, they would then say, okay, well, we manage all of our creator efforts, our content efforts, our influencer efforts through Coley, and here's a link to sign up with them, and we can take them into a, a folder for them and, and make that process super easy. Um, so once brands started treating us as their go-to platform to handle all of this, versus operating in silos, and just benefiting from the efficiencies that came with that, uh, we did start to kind of just build the network naturally. One thing I like talking about with everyone that comes on, on the show is yeah. really their individual rules for success. Mm -hmm. Are there any foundational principles you live your life by or kind of wake up and say to yourself every morning? So run towards the pain has been, <laughs> uh, has kind of been our, uh, our internal mantra and, and a great one for me personally. Yeah. And it all came from, I had just read about, or I just read um, Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah. And absolutely loved it. Yeah. So um, for whatever reason, I, I decided to, to just cold email him, and I just you know co-founded the company with Eric. This yeah. was 2016, and um, I just asked him like straight up like what advice could you give me? It was actually pretty general. Yeah. Did he um, get back to you? Yeah, he sure did. He got back to me in literally five minutes, yeah. and I couldn't believe that he had. I couldn't believe I would even like see that in my inbox. I was completely blown away, but I mean, the first thing that he said uh, was just to run, the, run towards the pain. So identify, identify what, you're, what you're avoiding or what you might be afraid of and just run towards it and, and tackle it full steam ahead because if you start to sweep things under the rug or you ignore them, you know, that's when you're actually going to experience real pain. Like that's real despair. Yeah. So instead of, instead of using fear as this like daunting headwind, um, both for our company and, and in my life personally, try to use it as a tailwind. Yeah. So it's like your, your brain has this amazing ability to identify threats and things that intimidate you, scare you. Um, but the more you know, we as a company can identify those challenges um, and have each one of us personally identify those, those challenges and the things that we're 
like, deeply afraid of and actually just run directly into them. Um, that seems to have worked very well for us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, at P3, we yeah, <laughs> yeah. constantly sharing books and things that inspire yeah. us internally so we can try to build up sort of our own, uh, you know, own armor, our own um, you know, yeah. intelligence base. Totally. What else, uh, what else are you reading these days? What do you find? Well, I'll tell you what, like, I think we're very fortunate, particularly as entrepreneurs, to, to live in a time period where we have all these mediums that make these incredible individuals who've done it before and, and have so many great, like, you know, tidbits of wisdom to share that they're just so accessible, right? So, um, you know, in 2019, I can actually say that like Reed Hoffman is a mentor of mine and I've never even been in the same room as Reed. Um, so, I mean, his podcast has been extremely helpful for, for all of us. We all listen to him, we all discuss. Um, I'm reading Blitzscaling right now, um, which, isn't, which hasn't necessarily been our philosophy around um, raising a ton of money and trying to corner a market. We've been, we've been lean. Um, we've sort of grown more sustainably, but you know, part of the reason for that is also that we know content is going to be important for brands for a long time. Yeah. Um, so by being platform agnostic and adapting to brands' varying content needs, we're able to um, fly above the clouds of, of certain trends and, and fads. Uh, and have you guys raised it all? Or are you growing organically entirely, bootstrapping? Kind of what's the approach? To yep. That? Um, all uh, <laughs> we have we have uh, four parents who, who are invested uh, <laughs> from, from Eric and I. Uh, those are our, our flagship guys. Now we did a uh, we did a pre seed and, and did some uh, some strategic angel uh, investment as well, but we stayed pretty lean, relatively speaking. Cool. Yeah. I think inevitably when you're starting a business, there's going to be hurdles and unforeseen, you know, sort of challenges around the corner. I'd love to hear about some of the hurdles you guys have had to overcome and, and how you did that. Trying to figure out how to get sleep at night is, is probably the biggest thing. Um, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, but no, I mean, beyond that, um, you know, it's trying to find the right people, right? So I think once you, once you, start, when, once you hit a certain company size, whether that be from you know, an, an ARR standpoint or simply from a, from a human um, standpoint, like, I think that the founders are only so um, are only so instrumental in, in what you're doing and, and how how successful you'll ultimately be. So I think you need to hire well, um, and that was something that that's that I think I grossly underrated or underestimated, um, just in terms of difficulty. Um, so yeah, I mean we've we've constantly been trying to refine that. I'm spending more and more of my own time uh, recruiting. Um, and trying to just get great people to fill great roles, and then all of a sudden, you know, you start to move into more of a you know, captaining of the ship um, type of role, and it's more about working on the business as opposed to into the business or inside the business, uh, which is certainly a critical difference. So, is that you know, if you were looking at yourself when you first started the company or even before yeah. that, you know, what advice would you give to yourself uh, outside of the higher better? Yeah, right. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm really trying to just enjoy the ride a little bit more now and, and um, sort of roll with the punches. I think early on I was so stressed out about like how do we, how do we get product market fit? Um, what else can we do? And I, I do still operate and we all still operate like we're, like we're on fire essentially. Um, but I also think like it, it's worth taking a step back and, and just being like wow this is this is really incredible, like what, a, what an awesome journey, like how much, I, it's so much fun to hire people, see them succeed, um, see them take on more, uh, have more and more great client stories, continue to meet people and, and really you know, at the end of the day like the best part about a business like ours is just the relationships that we build with clients and, and what we're able to build collectively um, as an actual company and I think you know, three years in I'm finally starting to realize that, that that's special and, and needs to be appreciated. Yeah, it seems yeah. like now you know you've got a kind of more of a focus on the culture. You know, what is the culture you're developing? Is it something that's yeah. you know you're taking a really strict focus on building, or is it something that's coming together organically and you're just seeing it mature? So. I do think it's important to define certain elements of your culture, um, but I also think what that ultimately leads to is that it, that heavily informs hiring decisions, and then that culture continues to grow off of those individuals who come into the company if that makes sense. Um, so high integrity is critical. Um, running towards the pain, like we literally will ask questions and sort of dance around that exact, and just saying that verbatim and, and just try to understand times that people have 
I've tackled things that are that are difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, we, we still want to be an incredibly like hardworking um, company with within you know within our ranks. And I tell the team all the time that, that we are in fact a team, not a family. And I think that's a critical difference. Um, you love your family unconditionally, and uh, a team with, within a team a structure, you are very much accountable to one another, and that means showing up, um, showing up fresh. That means. Um, thinking about ways to grow the entire business and particularly in our business um, you know we're, we're not at a size where people can just operate in a silo I mean, we need constant collaboration we need uh, we need people adding value and and not coming to myself or Eric with a problem it's coming with a problem and a proposed solution yeah. so what's next for Coley you know where do you see yourself in one five ten years Gosh. Um, I think for us you know, it'll be more and more around helping brands generate the types of content that's that's like difficult to create. So it might be more around uh, it might be more around animations. It might be more around you know, stop motion type videos. Things that are just kind of uh, difficult and, and hard to scale. And just continue to tap into great creators, um, which we're, who are obviously so grateful for. I mean, they they we are literally nothing without them. So yeah. uh, continuing to make them feel appreciated, take their feedback, weave it into what we're doing. Um, you know, has only benefited us and I think will continue to benefit us. But we also want to do a lot more around um, the sort of measurement and actual informing side. So I think it's, it's awesome that we've been able to become this like, uh, this content engine for these companies that's, uh, that's, that's really able to fill some very costly um, content gaps for them and help them, help them succeed, help them continue to grow. and. Um, ultimately grow their success of their company but um, for us if we can start to uh, if we can start to identify bigger content trends or uh, be able to tell them like what's working um, and help them then turn around and generate that types of content through Coley that we can be we can be more of an end-to-end -end solution so one example of that is is integrating the, the Facebook API um, which we did about six months ago uh, which basically allows us to um, it's pretty simple. I mean, a, a client will just sync up their, their Facebook business manager um, to our dashboard, and then anytime they use a Coley asset in an ad set, we're then able to reflect that data back into the Coley dashboard. And then you know, as a result, I think we can, by doing more of these integrations, uh, email providers, uh, business learning you know, integrations, whatever, it could just be ad tech platforms, um, but by just making brands more aware and, and shedding more light into sort of the, the mysterious um, concept of like what performs best. Like the more we can help shed light into that, uh, I think the more successful we'll be. So instead of just being the content engine, it's like, you know, you're, you're both generating, you're measuring, you're, you're measuring, you're, you're generating, you're, uh, you're activating, and then, and then you're actually refining. Uh, based on those learning. Generally speaking, yeah. you know, what trends are you seeing in the space, either on the influencer front or on the creative front that you think is really compelling that uh, yeah. e-commerce brands should know about? With influencers specifically, uh, it is starting to develop more of, uh, we're starting to see more and more brands develop this like, uh, this almost like army of, of up and coming creators. Um, so in the same sense that they have value from a content standpoint, um, it's almost like that everyone's after that like Emily Weiss Glossier model. Um, where you just have this, yeah, again, this like army of, of really passionate individuals who are also speaking to, uh, to networks that, of people who know them very personally. Um, and, you know, when we talk about like engagement rates, for example, many of these smaller people might have engagement rates of you know, 10, 20 percent. Um, so they're, off, they're oftentimes able to reach more people than someone, you know, with 50 times their followers just because they haven't, they haven't been watered down in, in a sense. Um, and with, with content specifically, I think it's, we're still in the stage where, where brands are getting comfortable with the idea of using content that they're not directly overseeing, right? Um, so I think more and more um, we're, seeing, we're seeing brands lean on, lean on data uh, and, and not necessarily their own gut feel around what they think is going to perform best. or. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to hear a lot less um, of 
the, uh, the types of comments that, that might be like, oh, well, we, we always, we know what performs best or our yeah. creative performs best. That type of assumption to me is based more in, in, um, in ego than, than it is in actually wanting to better the company and actually succeed and, and grow the company, which is ultimately uh, the goal of every business. Yeah, and I, I guess, are you seeing any trends from a channel perspective? So either up and coming social platforms or platforms that you guys are investing less in these days because you're seeing them become less effective? We certainly have thought long and hard about what to do specifically with, with Pinterest and Snapchat. And those are two that, that still have a world of potential, but you know, most of the time uh, brands are, are fairly, uh, I mean, it's, their ads can certainly perform really well, but in terms of just native content, I think you know, brands are still sort of trying to figure that out. Another thing that I think we need to um, continue to be thought leaders on is, is just this concept of video content, right? Which is just such an umbrella term and, and could literally you know, be everything from a feature film down to a boomerang. Um, but I think what I'm, what I'm seeing in terms of trends is that brands are starting to realize that they just need to like, they need to just go. They need to start testing things. They need to do things with with um, you know, aspirational video, with demo, with uh, demo type videos, with tutorials, yeah. with these unboxings, um, with just like POV type stuff, yeah. uh, whatever it might be. Um, but I think the brands that are are starting to put together a strategy on video uh, have a leg up on on those who who don't or, or just are staying away from it because they don't understand it. Creative fatigue is something we see across our client base consistently. And so right. We work with them to generate content for their websites, for their social media campaigns, for their direct response advertising right. campaigns. Love to hear your perspective on, uh, one, keeping it fresh, and, right. and uh, two, speed the market, because that's becoming huge, and you know, putting out creative consistently and, and creative that speaks to their customer base. Right, and um, I think fatigue is almost like the perfect word for it, right? Because it's it's almost the type of thing where you don't necessarily even know that it's fatiguing until it does, which, which means that you need to stay out in front of it. Um, and I think the best, way to, the best way to combat fatigue is to you know, have more and more content to work with all the time, which is why our best clients, like the Warby Parkers of the world, are, are the ones that are constantly getting out ahead of it. They have multiple campaigns running. They have um, you know, creative coming in on a, on a weekly basis. And, um, to be able to continue to, to stay out in front of it and almost be a little bit paranoid about your content performance and be like, you know, not get too comfortable with how things are performing, it, yeah. I think it's critical. And, um, you know, with, with websites, which you guys obviously have spent so much time working on and, and optimizing and just making them the smallest tweaks that can, that can drive huge, huge uh, returns and, and upticks in performance, um, you know, I think the content needs to, needs to follow suit. It needs to... It needs to be tweaked. It needs to be tested and uh, and refreshed constantly. Yeah, and you know, I'd love to hear about your your approach to testing specifically because I think there there's two schools of thought. It's you uh, really focus in on your demographics that you already know, and so it's finding influencers and finding creators that mm -hmm. can generate content really tightly targeted around that. And right. There's also a separate school of thought, which is let's find new audiences and new markets to target against. Right. So I'm wondering, is it a balanced approach with you or is it really client dependent? Those are the conversations that actually, uh, that I enjoy the most now is, is talking to clients or, or prospective clients about, about market share yeah. um, and reaching new audiences. So I mean, I'll give you an example. We work with this, with, uh, with a great company in Georgia called Peachkin Sheets. And when we first talked to them, um, this was just about a year ago, they were like, well, we don't, we don't really sell the millennials. Um, and that's kind of a staggering thing to hear in today's world. I mean, millennials now have the most purchase power of, of any generation that, that exists. So um, you know, we were able to dig in a bit more to that. And you know, they had told us, like, yeah, well, we, we've done a lot of testing with millennial audiences. And, um, you know, it, it hasn't, it just hasn't worked for us. And, and the follow-up question is like, oh, well, what types of content have you tried to test in those tests? And they're like, well, the same, the same creative that we've always used. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, you just thought that using um, you know, 45 year old subjects or you know, photos that appeal more to like a, a Midwest or Southern mom um, would just work with millennials as well. And they're like, well, I guess I guess that's a good point. <laughs> so part of it is just like, all right, like if if we're gonna try to if we're gonna have a market share conversation, like let's talk about 
having the content to help back that up and, and to help speak to people uh, in a more personal type of way. So that's exactly what they did. They started generating a lot more millennial focused content with us. And you know, now they're using that all over the place. They're starting to see a little bit of an uptick and we very much you know, expect that, that snowball to continue to grow. Yeah. And um, you know, when we're talking about market share and, and breaking into different audiences and, and um, giving people what they, what they need, um, that's, that's critical. I mean, when, when we'd run campaigns for, for Chobani not too long ago, they were actually focused on, on targeting messaging and testing different, um, different creative styles or, or even just different concepts, uh, specifically with Gen Z. Because you know, they've, they've done great with millennials, um, but part of the reason for that is that millennials start to think about their health a little bit more. Their metabolism slows down a little bit. Um, but with Gen Z, who's running around, you know, super active, um, haven't necessarily thought too much about the food they're putting into their body, they saw both a risk and a, and a void um, from a messaging standpoint. So they started to do more and more Gen Z-focused campaigns, uh, started to take learnings from that, and then uh, they were able to take those learnings and, and use them to inform you know, multi-million dollar ad campaigns, yeah. um, which is a great use case. Yeah, and I guess, you know, speaking of use cases, you know, what's, the, what's your pillar of success? What's the you know, client that's really taken Coley and run with it and really done it in an effective way that's helped grow their brand? Yeah, Warby Parker, the way that, they, the way that they've used us is, uh, was a bit of, a, was a, bit of a, a, a catalyzing moment for us because you know, they sort of see the world in, in the same way that we do. Um, and by being able to work with their performance team um, specifically, and, and who are, I mean, they're such brilliant individuals, they're so data driven, um, you know, they see third party content that is oftentimes very raw and they prefer iPhone images. Um, that's what they're seeing performing and, and they're, see, they're able to sort of take that gut feel out of it, um, read into the numbers and then turn around and make more informed decisions. And I think that philosophy uh, that they have is a big reason why they're doing you know, so darn well and why they're viewed as, as a bellwether brand. So I bring them up not just because they're a super you know, trendy name, um, they're just the type of brand that, that's uh, extremely validating in the sense that, that they are like that bellwether brand that, that a lot of brands will look to uh, as someone who's setting a pace. So we feel like with, if a brand like Warby Parker you know, sort of views the content world the same, that, the same way that we do, um, that's probably a sign that, that, um, that things are, are headed in our direction. Um, and naturally, I talk to the team about this all the time, but you know, if, if every client or every prospective client we talked to agreed with us wholeheartedly and saw the world exactly like we do, uh, Coley would have already existed and, and, um, and sold or, or IPO'd a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so you, you do have to be, you have to be a little out of the, or you have to be a little bit ahead of it. Is there any type of brand that's not a good fit for Coley or anyone that you're not going after right now because you're shifting product focus? Well, I'll tell you what, I think there's, there's really, there's no such thing as, as progress without some level of tension. And um, the individuals or the companies that we, we tend to uh, not necessarily connect with as well are, are the ones with creative directors who, who need to oversee every piece of content that has their brand associated with it, whether that be an influencer post. Um, or uh, content that they're disseminating on, on one of their channels or featuring somewhere. Um, that type of worldview is not one that, that we align with perfectly, <laughs> to be frank. Um, but in, in another sense, like, I think some of it, um, like for a long time we felt like we just couldn't, we couldn't figure out the beauty space. Um, and you know, by, by hiring people who have uh, intimate knowledge of the beauty space and have worked um, you know, tirelessly within that beauty space for many years, uh, we're able to start to realize, like, oh shoot, like that, <laughs> that premise that we where that we're just like not a great fit for the beauty industry is actually wrong. We just needed to think about it differently. We needed to really like dig in and, and understand how the dynamics of the space work and how decisions are made and, and you know what key stakeholders drive decisions. And I think that was a, a really interesting learning for us because. You know, you, you realize that different verticals have different different needs and different um, different ways of sort of thinking about things. And 
and just to try to apply a blanket model with what's worked in food and beverage um, in the beauty space isn't a successful strategy. Yeah. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. I think everyone's going to get a ton of value out of this, so I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to yeah. come have a chat. Yeah, Dave, such a pleasure. Huge fan of P3, and um, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Oh, All our pleasure. All right. Check out the link in our bio to learn more about P3 Media and Coley. Oh.